This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. What is the first game you think of when I say a hyped up title that missed its potential and deserves another shot? Take a minute and think about it, then write your answer in the comments. Always be plugging. Mine is Alpha Protocol, the globe-trotting espionage thriller about burned agent Mike Thornton that was supposed to push the limits of the RPG genre. The game promised to let you build a spy of your choice using preset motivations to set the baseline for the spy, then letting you flesh him out using dialogue prompts that deeply affect the story while leading you to one of three different endings that have a variety of different outcomes within themselves. Alpha Protocol was ambitious to say the least, but coming from Obsidian, the creative team between Knights of the Old Republic 2, and who would go on to create Fallout New Vegas and Outer Worlds, there was little reason to doubt their claims. But by the time it was released, it had evolved into a jumbled mess of mechanics, weak story threads, and gameplay held together by push pins and chewing gum. With this video, I wanted to set out and find the cause of what happened to Alpha Protocol, a game that was supposed to change everything, but instead is relegated to the any game under $10 buy one get one free section at your local game store. This is the story of how Alpha Protocol blew up on the launch pad. I think to fully understand Alpha Protocol, we need to first understand the state of Obsidian when development first began. Hot off the heels of the aforementioned Knights of the Old Republic 2's release in 2004, the company was on the verge of expanding in order to allow the resources to work on more than one project at once. While Obsidian had already grown to 27 members during KOTOR's development, 50 people were working for the company by the time Neverwinter Nights 2, a Dungeons & Dragons inspired RPG fantasy, released in 2006. In a surprising turn of events, Obsidian was aiming to head up production on a prequel to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, until a CEO shift at Disney brought in sweeping changes in direction and development of the game was scrapped. With Obsidian now in a precarious position and facing layoffs on the horizon without enough work to justify the size of the team, Sega swooped in right in the nick of time, asking Obsidian to develop a brand new IP for them. Until then, Obsidian made a name for themselves by making great games on previously existing series, meaning this was their shot at making something totally new. When Sega called and asked for a pitch, the idea of a spy RPG was proposed. In a VG 24-7 interview with senior producer Ryan Rosinski, the lead designer on Alpha Protocol, said the idea initially came from Obsidian co-founders Fergus Urquhart and Chris Jones during an outdoor lunch after a session of watching Jason Bourne movies. According to them, there had never been any kind of RPG like that, with most leaning into fantasy. Setting a role-playing game in a modern-day spy thriller would be a whole new breath of fresh air, and Sega agreed, approving of the concept immediately. At the same time, Sega contracted Obsidian to make a separate RPG based on the Aliens movie franchise called Aliens Crucible, but it was later cancelled, putting the team back into another rough spot. Desperate and needing to get back to work to stay afloat after the Snow White cancellation, Obsidian needed to get their contract signed as quickly as possible. So under the pressure of time, Obsidian agreed to sign over the rights to the Alpha Protocol name, meaning any sequel would have to be approved by Sega. Even with as much writing on Alpha Protocol's success as there was, early builds and ideas for the game were mostly directionless, with no one initially being named Project Lead. The story and the spy elements also meant new challenges for the team. With espionage being a central point, stealth segments had to be included, something the team had little experience with. To make matters even worse, Unreal Engine 3 was starting to cause a lot of problems. Eventually, the project started getting the attention it needed, and after two years in development time, the game finally got a director and lead designer through co-owner Chris Parker and creative director Chris Avalone, respectively. It was then that the two called a meeting to get the game's direction settled and to get the now 60-person team on the same page. A lot of the initial gameplay mechanics that were being worked on and planned were scrapped. Parkour segments and high-speed vehicle chases were removed entirely, although the motorcycle used in one of these chases does appear in one of the safe houses in the game. Hacking minigames were supposed to be removed as well, but Sega flexed their muscle and insisted they have them. In a Eurogamer article, Chris Parker said the minigames were clearly no fun, making it an easy choice to cut them. 
However, after being forced to keep them, the team settled on the lockpicking and hacking minigames in the final release. Side note, if these were the improvements over the ones that were cut, I can only imagine the cut ones were radioactive levels of bad. The ones we are left with hurt my eyes, kind of like looking at an ACT answer sheet. Everything just blends together. In terms of why the other features were cut, Parker said in the same interview that all these features they were working toward didn't have a payoff. However, even with a direction finally settled on, budget restraints meant features on the cutting room floor were about to get some new company, and the game's concept was still in the process of evolving. A female version of the protagonist was planned, but was scrapped because there was not enough money to re-record lines and animate all the cutscenes again. The game was supposed to be linear, but missions were broken up and players could choose which locations and missions to play in any order. Additionally, some story events and characters were cut. At the core of the game was always a story about spies and giving players the freedom to evolve the story through every conversation, leading to long-lasting results of your actions. But once Avalonian and Parker came in, the narrative was rewritten and reworked in order to merge the player actions into the story more tightly. While Sega supported the decision and helped find plot holes, Urquhart said Sega was too hands-off with the project, especially with budgeting. For instance, $500,000 was spent on making a slick, proof-of-concept vertical slice where the player would fight their way through an airplane until you jump out and parachute away. However, the time and manpower required to make this small segment wasn't feasible for an entire game, meaning this segment never made it into the final release. The final product had no major gameplay set pieces like this whatsoever, and instead tried to put story and dialogue choices in the forefront to carry the load. So while the gameplay itself doesn't take any risks and ultimately makes pretty bad choices in practice, the narrative and player choice is the real selling point of the game. Mike Thornton wakes up on an operating table, groggy and confused. He finds a PDA near him which springs to life revealing a woman on the other side named Mina who wishes to guide him to an escape route. After sneaking his way through corridors and knocking out all the guards in his way, a face on a TV nearby appears to tell Mike his test is over. Welcome to Alpha Protocol, an underground branch of the US government that handles the dirty work no one else wants to acknowledge. Mike was recruited because he was a soldier, or maybe because he was a former tech specialist, or possibly because college life was a bore and he wanted some action in his life. It's really up to the player who Mike is leading up to his recruitment. Most of Mike's story, personality, and appearance are customizable. You can grow any facial hair you want as long as it includes a goatee, and you can choose any race for Mike as long as it's white. So maybe his appearance isn't the blank canvas you expect from Skyrim or Fallout, but where I was impressed was how customizable the weapons and gear are as you upgrade them through the black market. Upgrades cosmetically change everything, which is cool because you don't need to open your inventory mid-mission to see what is equipped. You can just look at your gun. After getting initiated to the organization, Mike is sent by Westridge, the face who popped up on the TV during his test, to Saudi Arabia to secure stolen US weapons that were thought to have been used to shoot down a commercial jet. The targeted man suspected of leading the charge to steal the weapons is Ali Shahid. Mike is tasked with infiltrating Shahid's airbase and investigating until he finally tracks him down and faces off with him and his artillery. At first I was pretty bored with the opening story. Like a lot of military games and media of that time, it pushes the America good, Middle East bad storyline. I was worried we were heading down that samey rabbit hole based on what was happening. That was until the dialogue box opened with Shahid, and I was genuinely curious about what would happen if you heard his plea and let him walk instead of killing him or taking him into custody. What wasn't America is the world's hero tale turns into a story of corporate greed and Cold War tactics for influencing world events. After you free Shahid and vow to meet him later and pronounce him dead to your superiors, a missile strike hits at your position. Mike finds himself in the middle of a setup and is now burned. He's a rogue agent scapegoated by Halbeck, the corporation in charge of defense contracts in America that wants to pad its pockets by selling weapons to the highest bidders worldwide on the black market. Halbeck's size and power gives it a lot of sway in political affairs, but in order to take the profits up to an astronomical level, they plan on influencing the world into a World War III scenario through conspiracy and assassination. In order to save his own name, life, and the world, Mike sets out to gather intel on his own to take down Halbeck. This leads to a worldwide hunt for information, from Moscow to Rome to Taipei, in order to foil Halbeck's plans in each location. As the player, your choices influence the story and you can travel to the three cities in any order you want. 
Halbeck doesn't just let you waltz in and stop them, instead sending their own agents and contacts against you. In Taipei, you face a teleporting sniper who has your number from the moment you arrive. In Moscow, you extort a millionaire playboy who wants to be Scarface for money to fund your plans in exchange for sparing his life. You can spare or kill anyone you come across. The game takes your story decisions and adapts to what you choose instead of giving you a false sense of choice. When all was finally said and done, Alpha Protocol was a mess. The story asked you to take it seriously, but how can you when two seconds into gameplay, you get stuck in a door? But by the time I was done playing, I felt this wonkiness with the game, but I couldn't place what it was until I was really thinking about it. There's no fluidity between major mechanics. They don't directly speak to each other. On a fundamental level, there is a disconnect between the story, gameplay, and dialogue segments, the three main parts of this game. A good game with these three elements blend all of them together into a seamless package. Look at a game like Fallout, for instance. When you walk up to someone, you can talk to them or you can just shoot them because there is no barrier between gameplay and dialogue. In Alpha Protocol, on the other hand, everything feels distinctly fragmented and distanced from each other. Major conversations are relegated to their own missions where you're loaded right into it. You don't control Mike's movement, you just interact with a cutscene that has multiple outcomes. You have conversations over here, the outcomes lead to new missions being unlocked over here, and these missions just push the story over here. And while there are a couple of outlier moments, the game feels like it decides when you're in control and when you're talking to a person of interest. It's like crossplay between PS4 and PS Vita. The games are close to being immediately transferable between consoles, but you have to press the sync button first. That little bit of resistance makes a big difference. I think this would all be passable if the gameplay was at least somewhat decent. I smiled and laughed the whole time I played, and not in the way the developers likely intended. Alpha Protocol's gameplay base is rough. If you're like me and tried putting stat points into technical skills instead of weapon competency from the get-go, you're going to have a disaster of a time. Weapon accuracy is tied to RNG dice rolls that determine how straight you shoot, meaning you'll have the accuracy of a child with his eyes closed in an earthquake early on. This makes gunplay, a major part of the game, completely unsatisfying. Even after making the decision to dump all my stat points into assault rifle competency, I still didn't feel great about it until the end of the game. The same goes for pistol use, but to hone in on headshots you have to aim, hold still long enough for the reticle to turn red, and then fire. It's not calculated like a splinter cell game, it's just slow. You're constantly fighting your stat choices, which means you're constantly fighting the urge to upgrade your other attributes like hacking ability, which help minimize the threat of hacking mini games the developers didn't even want in their game in the first place. Alpha Protocol promised gameplay that offers choice in how you tackle levels, and while there are slight tweaks in dialogue depending on if you go in guns blazing or if you're more careful, it doesn't feel like there is a substantial difference at the end of the day. But that is where the dialogue options and conversation mechanics really come into play. In retrospectives on Alpha Protocol, I tend to see that Mike Thornton is a man who wears a different mask depending on who he talks to. In most cases, I agree with that. Conversations between Mike and other characters are less about being a consistent Mike Thornton you want to play as, but rather you put on a mask that gels with the personality of the person you're speaking to. Mike's masks mostly fit three different archetypes based on three well-known spy-esque characters of the time. The sarcastic and flirtatious James Bond, the professional who wants to get the job done Jason Bourne, and the unstoppable president assassinating guns blazing I want everyone dead but me mass murderer from 24 Jack Bauer. When you are in a back and forth conversation, you must answer and continue the chat by answering aggressively, professionally, or sarcastically. At first I tried really hard to make my version of Mike Thornton somewhere in between James Bond and Jack Bauer, usually answering every question with an HR violation or a quip, while making sure I took a volume over precision approach of killing everyone in order to make sure I definitely got my man. But instead of taking the bait and engaging in a snarky back and forth, a lot of characters were like, uh, get out of my face if you're going to waste my time, you immature idiot, or I will not sleep with you, you narcissistic creep. If flattery is your only weapon, you'll need a gun. And fast. If you play this game, learn from my mistakes and read the files the game provides you and the people you were going to meet beforehand, and talk to them in a way they'd be receptive to. 
However, I did notice that while I was answering sarcastically and aggressively, Mike started absorbing those traits into his personality during cutscenes and dialogue I had no control over, which I found genuinely fascinating. It did feel like in my own way I was shaping the personality of this character organically, which was the big promise of this game when it was announced. The story itself felt equally as influenceable. While I personally felt the overall plot was a bit played out, the individual threads that could vary through player choice felt more freeing than most games, even today. In the game you meet an assassin for hire named C. Through some smooth talking you get her to spare your life and become allies. However, on a later mission she diverts from your plan and uses herself as bait to get more information from a target but she immediately finds herself in over her head, winding up in a torture situation that has her dangerously close to death. You have the option to divert from your plan and save her or continue the mission. Given the expectations that she would be fine because she was a main character, an ally, and had full on speaking parts, I continued the mission under the assumption that she would be fine. She was not. The game killed her off, off screen, no pomp and circumstance. She was just gone. And of course she was. Why, if you were playing as a character that was by the book and focused on the mission, would the game try to tug at the heartstrings? Instead, the game says, if you want to prioritize the mission, so be it. There will be consequences, but you weighed the choices and chose the mission. We're not going to pretend to make you feel guilty. That choice had rippling effects through the rest of the story, and that was my inaction that caused them. This is where Alpha Protocol starts to reveal some of its magic to the player. You make choices, you deal with their repercussions. While there are three broad endings that I mentioned before, your decisions affect how those three endings play out. The people who you build relationships with will decide who you end up with as the credits roll. I think that's interesting because you get to ride off into the sunset with the people you grew attached to and who helped you the most. Granted, you get the ride into the sunset ending, that is. It's really just unfortunate that the payoff does not match the tone of the game. It's hard to appreciate the full weight of the game and story and choices when the parts you have direct control over during gameplay segments feel so stripped down, and no game from 2010 would be complete without ample amounts of ragdoll physics. Alpha Protocol is broken. There's no way around it. There is no cohesion between elements in the game, and while some of the issues stem from a lack of direction early in development, some issues could have been squashed with some extra debug time. Some games have to make compromises to hit deadlines. Alpha Protocol was the opposite. Initially, the game had a late 2009 release date, but due to blockbuster titles like Mass Effect 2, a game that offered very similar levels of customization and branching story paths, Sega kicked the release back to 2010. Instead of taking the extra time to fix the army of problems with the gameplay, Sega just sat on it until release. As of 2019, Obsidian still doesn't understand Sega's reluctance to fix bugs, especially since the game now had to follow smash hits like Uncharted 2 and Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, two games that stole the attention of a lot of critics and gamers alike. Nevertheless, May 2010 came and Alpha Protocol released to the masses. Obsidian knew the game needed polish, but the team reportedly still felt confident that if people could get past the gameplay issues, they would appreciate the story. The dev team expected a Metacritic score of 80, and when the reviews came out, the score was substantially lower, disheartening the team immensely, according to Chris Parker. While the game was justifiably panned for the jank, this past decade has given us the gift of retrospect, allowing us to remove Alpha Protocol from the conversation surrounding other games at the time. Alpha Protocol does manage to pull off what it said it would in the story department, allowing direct influence over who lives and who dies, but the novelty of playing a game where the gameplay is ripping itself apart at the seams wears off quickly, meaning I'll likely never go back and see what other outcomes the game holds. Do I think it's worth playing once? Yes. It's good to look at longingly while wondering what could have been, letting your imagination run wild on what a sequel could have looked like. Unfortunately, Sega seems to be moving in the direct opposite direction of a sequel after recently delisting the game from digital storefronts due to expired music licenses. So now the only way to buy a copy is a physical second-hand copy, and while technically that makes the physical versions rarer now, no one seems to really care. I picked up my copy for $7 at a game store near me. So if we never see an Alpha Protocol sequel, which seems incredibly likely, Chris Parker says Alpha Protocol still lives in the consciousness of Obsidian, just not in the way you might expect. Remember when we f***ed this up in AP? Let's not do that again. I couldn't have said it any better myself.
Thanks so much for watching this far into the video, I really appreciate it. If you like the video, consider leaving a like on it. If you want more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell if you want to be notified of any future videos. Lastly, if you want to support my channel directly, you can check out the link to my Patreon in the description below. For $1 a month, you get early access to my videos and some extra videos you can't get anywhere else. I'd like to take a moment and thank my higher tier patrons, Okayla, Just Jessica, 8BitJesus, Andrew Elmore, and Andrew Lang. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.